Chapter 2 The City and Its Neighborhoods Just in case you hail from out of town, I'll begin this chapter by telling you that Manhattan is one of the five boroughs that make up New York City. The other four are the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Odd as it may seem, even though New York City officially includes all five boroughs, people who live here only refer to Manhattan as the city, somehow leaving out the other four, as if they were actually in the suburbs, or in another state altogether. Each of the five boroughs actually has its own fascinating history and unique landmarks, and each one offers plenty of opportunities for getting rich via real estate. But in this book, I'd like to focus only on Manhattan because it offers investment opportunities on a grander scale than the other four boroughs. I will also include some information about the other, so-called outer boroughs, just to offer some comparison and perspective. But my own personal investment preference remains Manhattan. Manhattan is magical. Did you know there are 36 privately owned streets in Manhattan? Yes, you can buy a city street. A few of these private streets are famous for their beauty. For example, the gated Pomander Walk that connects West 94th and West 95th Streets between West End Avenue and Broadway, or Washington Mews in Greenwich Village. But some of them are secret venues and don't even show up on public maps. Did you know that Manhattan has quite a number of fake buildings? For example, Mulry Square at Greenwich Avenue and 7th Avenue South, famous as the former location of a diner that inspired Edward Hopper's iconic painting Nighthawks. It later became a parking lot and a spontaneous 9-11 memorial until a building was erected there, which is not really a building at all, but a facade that disguises a giant subway ventilation shaft. There are also at least a dozen famous haunted houses in Manhattan. These include the Morris Jamel Mansion in Washington Heights, the Ear Inn, the romantic One If I Land, Two If I See restaurant, and the White Horse Tavern in the West Village, as well as the Algonquin Hotel and the New Amsterdam Theater, to name just a few. The combined square footage of all the indoor parking spaces in Manhattan equals two central parks. I'd like you to take a journey with me through the neighborhoods of Manhattan and its surroundings, This will allow you to gain a solid preliminary understanding of what advantages each of the neighborhoods offers and match these against your investment plans and expectations. Manhattan is a dynamic, fast-paced city, always in flux, rebuilding, renovating, and discarding its old look for the sake of the new. This has been happening since it was first settled by the Dutch in the early 17th century. Every now and then its neighborhoods acquire cool new nicknames, like Hell's Kitchen in Midtown, where dangerous gangs once roamed. It's a great neighborhood now. And once in a while, an entirely new neighborhood even sprouts up, like Hudson Yards, which was built in 2012 on the old rail yards near the Hudson River between 27th Street and 34th Street. Hudson Yards, in fact, is the largest private real estate development in the history of the United States. Younger generations of Manhattanites may not realize that not long ago, a neighborhood name like Nolita sounded hip and new, since today it's considered a well-known place with a name that everybody recognizes. Similarly, today when I refer to the new real estate development area of 57th Street as Billionaire's Row, some of my clients may still have no idea what I'm talking about. But I'm sure that a few New York minutes from now, that name will be old news too, and we'll have some even newer ones to get used to. Whenever my clients are considering different neighborhoods to live or invest in, I always recommend that they gain some first-hand experience. I counsel them to spend some time in the neighborhood and walk up and down its streets at different times of the day and in the evening. I also tell them to visit both during weekdays and over the weekend in order to soak in each neighborhood's special atmosphere. A neighborhood may look great during the week, but become crowded on weekends. This may or may not bother you. My advice is that you get to know a neighborhood's landmarks and attractions on a personal level. Explore its museums and restaurants, and find out as much as you can about local schools, hospitals, shops, parks, playgrounds, and public transportation. 
you can Google the neighborhood, check out a Wikipedia article about it, or even buy a tourist guidebook. No matter how much you already know about a neighborhood, you can usually discover something new and surprising in any one of these guidebooks. In the beginning of this book, I made you a bunch of promises, claiming to possess almost supernatural abilities in real estate. What I am really offering you is common sense and many years of personal experience in the field. Let me give you a little demonstration of what I mean by making a simple common sense suggestion I wish someone had shared with me back when I was just starting out in real estate. When selecting a Manhattan neighborhood in which to buy a property, think a few years ahead and consider that neighborhood not from your current point of view, but from where you see yourself a few years in the future. Why is that, you may ask? For two reasons. Reason number one is quite simple. In the course of a few years, your life situation may, and probably will, change. If you're single today, you may find yourself in a committed relationship a few years from now. Stranger things have happened. And possibly even with a couple of kids. Reason number two the average lifetime of property ownership in Manhattan is about 5 to 10 years because that's the average duration of the cycle during which the value of properties appreciate. Chances are, a few years down the road, you'll be selling the property you're about to buy today. Real estate prices in New York vary greatly depending on the school district in which the property is situated. Being single with no kids today, you probably couldn't care less about the reputation of any of the local schools. Tomorrow, when you have kids, you're likely to be obsessed with the subject. And if not you, then whoever is buying your property will be. The same goes for public transportation. Issues like the distance from the property to the nearest subway station, path train, or bus stop are key. If you drive a car or take cabs everywhere and are concerned with trains or buses, think again because in a few years you may want to sell that property, and your buyer is likely to care and pay more if it's located closer to public transportation. If the public transportation situation in your chosen neighborhood isn't ideal, perhaps the word is out that it's going to improve in a few years? Is a new subway line going to finally reach your neighborhood, as the Q line recently did on the Upper East Side? Or maybe an entirely new, revolutionary form of transportation will become available, the way it happened a few years ago with City Bike. Today, prospective buyers, rather than asking me about subways, often inquire if there's a City Bike station nearby, something no one could have predicted even a few years ago. What's going to be next, I wonder? Electric hovercraft charging pads? Another important thing to consider is access to the neighborhood for lower-income workers who serve the neighborhood infrastructure. Your local hairdresser or gas station attendant may not be fortunate enough to afford a condo in your cool neighborhood, but how convenient it may be for them to get to work affects not only their quality of life, but also the price for your property. Once you are familiar enough with the neighborhoods you are interested in, you should take your next steps online. Study websites such as StreetEasy.com, Trulia.com, Zillow.com, all three are owned by Zillow Group, or their alternative, Realtor.com. Visit websites that belong to such well-known real estate brokerage companies such as Douglas Elliman, Elliman.com, Corcoran Group, Corcoran.com, and the new up-and-coming contender, Compass, Compass.com. Or, better yet, visit BroadwayRealty.com, which may be the best online real estate site in town. And I am not just saying this because I launched it myself. Study the listings on that website and then call the Broadway Realty office at area code 212-577-2270. That's area code 212-577-2270. If you say that you discovered the number in this book, I'll help you pick the best properties for you in any neighborhood that you like. Another curious concept you should know about is landmark preservation. In order to protect Manhattan's rich and unique architectural history, the New York City Landmark Preservation Commission selects some of its most interesting buildings as being historically valuable. Areas with a large concentration of such buildings are known as 
landmark districts. Such districts are governed by special real estate laws. The facades and interiors of historic buildings, for example, cannot be changed without a special permit from the Landmark Preservation Commission. If you, as a property owner, decide to change windows or doors in your landmark building, or simply prefer to paint its facade, you must first present your plans to the Commission, and the process of receiving the required permit may take a few months. In spite of these restrictions, many Manhattan real estate investors prefer landmark districts, believing them to be the most stable and least prone to undesirable changes due to their unique historic look and character. Such thinking is often valid, but every now and then it leads investors into a trap of sorts. If, for some reason, the market changes after you purchase the landmark building, you may be unable to change the building's original use or make other improvements to prevent it from becoming a loss to you financially. And sometimes, modifying or restoring the facade of a landmark building involves such high expenses that the building becomes a burden for its owner, who allows it to fall into disrepair. Let's move on and take a closer look at each one of Manhattan's wonderful neighborhoods. There is more than one way to skin a cat, and there is also more than one way to subdivide Manhattan. Some of the boundaries between neighborhoods in fact can seem arbitrary, like where does Nolita end and Soho begin? In spite of that, I will try to divide things up in the easiest and most practical way for listeners. Purists may not like my primitive map of Manhattan neighborhoods, but I hope real estate investors will find it useful. I propose that we begin at the southern tip of the island and move up in a sort of smooth northbound zigzag. Battery Park City Let's begin with Battery Park, one of the youngest neighborhoods in Manhattan. Created a little over 40 years ago, the land on which the neighborhood is situated didn't even exist until its establishment. The lower part of the land was taken from the bottom of the Hudson River, while the topsoil itself actually existed as the ground over the current World Trade Center area. On the eve of construction for the original Twin Towers, that ground was excavated and moved in order to form the new land available for real estate development. So, all the land under the foundations of Battery Park City is essentially man-made. That land itself is owned and managed by the Battery Park City Authority, a public benefit corporation created by New York State and rented out to real estate developers and building owners under a 100-year contract. I should probably mention that typically in New York City, any buildings constructed on rental land are cooperatives. Battery Park City is an exception. Most of the buildings there are condominiums, with a few rentals added in for good measure. At the time of this writing, there are still 55 years left in the land rental contract, long enough for most banks and mortgage companies to finance condominiums in Battery Park City as if they were built on the condominium owned land. Real estate prices in Battery Park City are 15 to 20 percent lower than in most other neighborhoods of Lower Manhattan due to that rental contract. Condo owners in Battery Park City pay about 20% more for monthly services, also known as common charges, than what they'd pay in Midtown, but this is compensated by lower prices for the condos themselves. If less than 25 years remains under the land rental contract, the price of the residential property becomes equal to the difference between the monthly rent and the monthly service payments, multiplied by the number of months remaining in the land rental contract. Let me illustrate this with a simple example. Let's suppose that there are 20 years, 240 months, remaining on the rental contract for the land that hosts your property. The monthly service payment for your co-op or condo, including monthly tax in the case of the condo, equals $3,000, and the same apartment would be rented for $7,000 per month. The difference between the monthly rent and service cost would be $4,000. Multiply this difference by the number of months remaining on the land rental contract, $4,000, times 240 months, and the result, $960,000, is the apartment price. Often, the land rental agreements include the option to renew the contract. The buyer must always calculate how the service payment will change when such a contract is renewed. Most commonly, land rental agreements in New York do get renewed, 
even though sometimes that happens after prolonged feuds between the landowner and the renter. Battery Park City is remarkable for its parks and its closeness to the water. It's one of my favorite neighborhoods, a city within a city separated from the Wall Street area by the West Side Highway. There are about 6,000 condominiums and 1,000 apartments for rent in Battery Park City. From the day they are placed on the market, a typical Battery Park City condominium or rental apartment is gone within four to six weeks, given the huge demand. In addition to being unique in its origin and type of land ownership and management, Battery Park City also features some distinctive buildings and neighborhood attractions. America's first LEED certified residential high rise building, the Solaire, is located here at 20 River Terrace and stands next door to another LEED certified residential building called Visionaire at 70 Little West Street. The neighborhood also features two highly prestigious hotels, the Ritz Carlton and the Conrad New York. The latter shares its address, 102 North End Avenue, with the huge Regal Battery Park movie complex. Several years ago, just around the time the United States was at the lowest point of a recession, Battery Park City received a surprise economic boost. The headquarters of Goldman Sachs, a leading global financial services firm, opened its new offices at 200 West Street. This increased the demand for residential properties, since the bankers wanted to live close to work. New restaurants sprung up seemingly overnight, including Danny Meyer's North End Grill, Shake Shack, and Pier A with its Long Hall and Oyster Bar. Luxury retailers, such as Hermes, Burberry, Zegna, and dozens of others, all opened new locations in the Brookfield Place Mall, a commercial renter conglomerate at 230 VC Street. Another event that occurred in the neighborhood is the stuff of legend within the Manhattan real estate community. In 2011, a group of 11 condo buildings in Battery Park City put some pressure on the aforementioned Battery Park City Authority Corporation and managed to negotiate a deal that allowed them to lower the combined rental cost of the land by $279 million. This boosted Battery Park City's residential real estate market even more. It also illustrated the fact that building owners are not powerless, even when they don't own the actual ground their buildings stand on. Battery Park City is one of the greenest neighborhoods in the city, and it's a lot quieter than most other residential areas in Manhattan because there's practically no street traffic. Alas, there's also no subway. You'll have to walk across the West Side Highway to get to the closest train station. However, there are five city bike stations here all placed along the excellent bike lane that connects the neighborhood with the rest of the city and the Battery Park City Ferry Terminal, which offers access to the New York Waterway Ferry and water taxis. The latter are becoming an increasingly regular part of many New Yorkers' commute. If you drive, you have easy and quick access to Brooklyn and Staten Island. Living here, you'll also have the best view in the city of the 4th of July fireworks display and the yearly New York Yacht Club regatta. As many Battery Park City apartments offer open views of the Hudson River estuary, the architects and engineers who designed the neighborhood made sure to include a lot of balconies in the floor plans. Unfortunately, the last constructed buildings here were completed in 2017, and there are no more available lots to build on in Battery Park City.